from Pearl Harbor on the night of October 23rd. Admiral Nimitz radioed a message to the Chief of Naval Operations in Washington, D.C. The Second Battle of the Philippines had begun. For the men of the Third Fleet, this was the climax to a battle they had been waging for months. The men who were over Saipan in June, Guam in July, Palau in September, were moving west. They were hitting hard all over the map, all around the clock. and Navy flyers had pounded Japanese defenses from one end to the other. But they all pointed toward one day, October 19, and one target, the Philippines. The invasion force was protected by our mighty third and seventh fleet. The 100,000 GIs didn't know where they were heading, but they knew it would be the last place the Japs wanted them to go. There were hundreds of islands to pick from, and the enemy couldn't watch them all. It wasn't to be Luzon, where we fought our heroic delaying action at Bataan and Corregidor. It wasn't to be Mindanao, where Philippine guerrillas have never ceased fighting. Instead, our Joint Chiefs of Staff had chosen an inconspicuous island with a name most Americans had never heard. But overnight, it would be spoken in the same breath with the Coral Sea, Midway, and Guadalcanal, Leyte. America was ready to fulfill her promise. Return to the Philippines. Sixth Army hit Philippine beaches and fought inland. Liberation of 16 million Filipinos was on the march, led by General MacArthur and President Osmania. Back home, Americans read the optimistic headlines and thought the worst was over. But the Navy knew the main event was still to be fought. This was the day our Navy had been waiting for. But it was also the day for which the Japanese High Command had been waiting. For they knew they were sending this battle fleet against us with the odds as high in their favor as they would ever be. Their supply lines were shorter, their fleet had been resting in home waters and could be supported by hundreds of land-based planes. <laughs> In the language of military men, our army was committed to this action. This was the fateful moment of every invasion, when a mighty army stands with one foot on land and the other in the sea. Knowing this, the Japanese were ready to unfold their master plan. 
a crushing pincer movement of battleships, cruisers, and destroyers will navigate the narrow approaches to the American beachhead, cutting MacArthur off from his supply lines and destroying naval support. And, in addition, we have planned another surprise. Before they reached the approaches to Leyte, the Japs lost the important element of surprise. Our submarine, searching deep in enemy waters, surfaced right in the middle of the Japanese fleet, broke radio silence to flash back the report. And that's not all they did. They sank two Japanese cruisers. The Navy had eyes above the sea as well. We knew what was coming and where it was coming from. And our carriers lost no time dispatching a reception committee. Hour after hour, the two oncoming Japanese forces forming the pincers ran a gauntlet of bombs, torpedoes, and tracer fire, and then, under cover of darkness, our destroyers crept into Surigao Strait under the big guns of the Jap Southern Force and let go their torpedoes. The PTs were there too before me. It was a rugged trip through both straits for the Emperor's invincible forces, but they fought on, determined to break through. As the jaws of the pincers kept closing, Admiral Kincaid had to make a vital decision. By 3 a.m., this southern prong of the Jap pincer was going to be too close to our beachhead for comfort. The Admiral decided to concentrate his main firepower down here and hit them from all sides as they came into the Gulf. Meanwhile, Admiral Sprague was holding his light carrier force here to guard our right flank. Then, if everything went right, we could knock out this southern threat in time to protect our beachhead from their big battleship task force fighting its way around Samar. Admiral Halsey would be rushing up to hurl his third fleet against a new Japanese surprise party reported bearing down from the north. Ready to blast the southern section of the Tokyo Express were five battleships the Japs had never expected to face again. The California, the West Virginia, the Pennsylvania, the Maryland, the Tennessee. The old battle wagons that had lain in muddy humiliation at Pearl Harbor were waiting for revenge. Bearing 273. Bearing 273. Range 12500. Range 12500. Coming on target, sir. Permission to open fire, sir. All right, we're ready. The first salvos were fired in a range of over 25,000 yards, nearly 13 miles, and scored a direct hit. That's American gunnery, laying our main batteries on a moving target in the dead of night. The chips were down for the heaviest surface action of World War II. By 5 a.m., the southern enemy force turned and fled, that is, all but 10 warships, which reached the Gulf of Leyte, the bottom of the Gulf. While the lower prong of the enemy pincer was being smashed, the upper prong was closing in through San Bernardino Strait, led by Japan's newest, fastest battleships. This force had been pounded and straight until it turned back, only to come on again in one last fanatical attempt to smash through to our beachhead. Nothing stood between them and their objective except a group of low-speed, unarmored baby flat tops, screened by a handful of destroyers and destroyer escorts. The powerful 16 and 14-inch guns of these Japanese dreadnoughts were leveled against the light batteries of our escort vessels. 
never outfought, but outgunned, outnumbered, outmatched. Our jeep carriers radioed for help to Admiral Halsey's third fleet in the north. Admiral Halsey had to make a difficult decision. Should he go to the rescue and ignore the surprise from the north? Should he hold his position and leave our small force off Samar to fight overwhelming odds? The Admiral did neither. Instead, he kept the main units of his powerful command on its course, but dispatched a carrier group to the Samar battle area. Facing the murderous barrage of the Jap heavyweights at point-blank range, these little ships, fighting a desperate battle for time, used everything in the book to stay afloat and never stopped firing until the sea closed over for them. A grateful people will remember their names. The Gambia Bay, the USS Cole, the Johnston, the Samuel B. Rubber. Theirs is a new and valiant chapter in our naval history. On the dawn of the third day, while the battle was still raging in the south, the curtain was rising in the north on another phase of this great naval engagement. Sweeping down from Japanese home waters came this third great enemy force, supported by waves of land-based bombers, dedicated to the imperial mission of striking the finishing blow for Hirohito. The Japs were flinging on the board of war their highest stakes, their future as a naval power. Once again, our fighting men rose up to meet the enemy. Even the men of the sunken Princeton fought on from other decks. Our pilots swarmed from more carriers than the Japs had ever seen before to knock the enemy out of the sky, blast them from the sea. Below them was the Japanese fleet. This was it. but you can't get them all. Sometimes we had to fight fire and Japs at the same time. Some of ours had trouble up there too. Everyone they crippled, more were taking off.
zigzag crazily, but there was no place in the Philippine Sea this day where they could hide from the most devastating attack ever launched in the Pacific. to turn and run for home. For even while thousands of Japs were being fished out of the very waters they had considered their own private sea, our fleet was hunting down the remnants of three Imperial forces. And as night fell on the last day of battle, this was all that would ever be seen of 24 Japanese warships and 400 enemy planes 35 more warships were sinking or straggling home. For every victory, men must die. It was battle-smashed trains like these that told the story of that victory eloquently. For here in this plane, damaged beyond repair, an American airman died at his battle station. His shipmates felt it fitting that he be buried this way. For now, let him be nameless. Let him be all the sons of America who have died for our cause. Let his death make that cause all the more precious to us, the living. with the enemy wounded but desperately rebuilding his fleet for a savage defense of his island fortress. Our course is set for 1945, pointing past Leyte and Mindoro, beyond the Philippines, through Japan itself. A dangerous foe that again and again must be brought to action. <laughs> <laughs> 